Okay, today we have a special edition of the Divi Crypto podcast. Not usually on video, but my good buddy Christian Kamer is here from Sustany Capital. So you know it's about to get super deep down the rabbit hole. This time, you guys may remember actually Christian coming on the show to talk about CBDCs in the past, as well as the debate on stable coins, which is still a legendary episode of the podcast. Christian, welcome back. Hey, good to see you. Yeah, it's always it's always great to to get on uh, Zoom with you and and chat about the variety of things going on in the industry. Today, we're going to be talking mostly about CBDCs, your updated perspective on such, as well as maybe a little bit of cybersecurity stuff. So uh, I'm excited to have you here, man. Yeah, always really good to talk to you. There's not too many people that can ask a lot of intelligent questions that I can have intelligent discussions with. <laughs> Most people already kind of like miss the necessary vocabulary, unfortunately. I do probably experience that on a daily basis too. It's it's a steep learning curve. I heard someone say, actually, um, it was this British comedian. He, he, he was describing cryptocurrency as a, that cryptocurrencies combine everything you didn't know about finance with everything you didn't know about computers. <laughs> is, I, I think that's a pretty apt description. I think. Apt analysis, yes. <laughs> yeah, for, for most people. So. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, okay, why don't we start with a little bit of, of history here. Give us your, your prior uh, short version opinion on CBDCs so that we have some context sure. and perspective. Yeah, so originally I tend to consume all the white papers that concern the design of new type of currency technologies. And so I started reading all of the CBDC design proposals and they, they kind of try to cluster them into wholesale and retail, but ultimately that part really doesn't matter as well, we'll get to. And so they, most of them promote the idea that this new technology in a way will, I'd say, make cryptocurrencies obsolete for, for people at large because it's using central banks to issue currencies that is supposedly um, safe, secure, stable, and then also uh, provide kind of uh, the reliability that people are used to from the banking system about or the cumbersome overhead, but then also promise to uh, bank the unbanked and enable cross-border payments and a lot of other things. And that, that sounded all really good, right? So it sounded really attractive. So I read dozens of them and kind of started to classify them. And the more I thought about this, uh, I kind of realized that A, um, the, the re recurring theme was we are researching it, right? So the, these were all like research papers. So we'll keep researching it, we're we'll, we'll watching other people's pilots. But then the two things that I noticed pretty early on was that two of the teams that came to the same conclusion that we came to uh, probably three or four years ago, four years ago now, is that, well, if I have an actual digital bear instrument, so if I have something that I can exchange with another person that quote unquote settles instantly because it's digital and bytes can in principle move close to the speed of light, then at that point in time, why do I even need a payments provider at all, right? So why do I need people in the middle and then in the past historically, when you do a digital financial transactions, uh, then there's on average four to five entities involved that facilitate that. So that could be your bank, then the bank of the merchant that you're engaging with, then on top of that, there might be a real from MasterCard or Visa, and then there might be uh, a, a third party that's also doing some interchange on the currency level. So anyway, so there's a lot of parties involved and all of them obviously want to be compensated for that. All of them introduce their, their own policies and with policies usually come time delays and they're all running database solutions that need to be reconciled on an infrequent basis and 
for whatever reason, they also don't reconcile after 5 p.m. anymore because apparently databases need sleep. Um, but the larger point there being is so while this sounded all good after watching this now for, I forgot when we did the last recording, must have been at least a year ago, right? Just about, but, yeah. So, the more and more I heard the kind of the same drum roll without any new um, insights or any recognition of what the technologies deliver on in the open source community, um, the more uncomfortable I got with the original description. So that's why I reached out to you and say, hey, I, I, I don't actually think I, my original thesis on the, these particular instruments providing some benefit to citizens at large stands at least at least not at this moment so right now these seem to be basically straw man discussions to um, in a kind of a political way a virtual signal there is a movement on that topic so don't even bother engaging with any type of open source solutions that address the legacy financial system and any of the drawbacks that could come with it. But I'm going to stop here because then we can like break down the kind of the obvious things in that. But no, that's that's great. No, that's great to have that context. And it's always, you know, you got to have respect for somebody that can take new information, restructure their opinion, their thesis um, based on that new information. And we have seen a lot of new information coming out about CBDCs, including a lot of new uh, papers, research papers that seem to have sh started to shift the narrative away from, yeah, it's going to be this, you know, open system or, or the system that influences positively the, the society that, that uh, it serves and more toward, oh, shoot, are we obviating ourselves <laughs> by, by putting these things out? And so yeah. speak to that a little bit, you know, how have, how has the research um, narrative shifted that you're seeing? I mean, so the, the research narrative is basically stale at this point in time. They're claiming all the same things. Uh, everybody's pointing to each other saying, well, we're watching, we're carefully watching uh, like the existing pilots, i.e. the Chinese efforts all by it. And that's, again, this is just my personal opinion, but I think to even apply the label central bank digital currency to what um, the Chinese central bank is doing is somewhat iffy. So in, in, in my personal view, these are just instruments of surveillance at the end of the day. I, I think all of the claims that there's going to be private peer-to-peer -peer transactions, I find that not very believable given the track record of that government. and given my personal experiences with people in that country and hearing from people that live in that country. And I think most people have heard all these anecdotes of not being able to use public transportation because you um, disagreed with the party line on Twitter or something or on social <laughs> media. And so in with that background, I, I think to look towards that development and find anything useful in there is very questionable but then generally speaking obviously technology is neutral right so you can use the hammer to put a nail in the wall or you can use a hammer to put um to bash someone's head in so in that same way technology is as much the same it's neutral which is another rabbit hole that also bothers me on a daily basis and that that goes very much in the same bucket. There's always these announcements that the, the governments will regulate crypto, the governments will regulate stable coins, the government will regulate um, blockchains and so forth. And every single time that is just a semantic conflation and it's used for propaganda purposes because obviously stable coins, blockchains, cryptocurrencies, they are regulated. They are regulated by code, right? So, and, governments don't regulate technology, governments and the agencies regulate the behavior of people inside of the jurisdiction. So the problem obviously with that is if you phrase it in this particular way as a regulator and you phrase it not like we're gonna protect investors and we're gonna start regulating stable coins, but you say, well, we're gonna limit what you citizens can do with this particular technology. The response is usually somewhat different and in my personal 
um, opinion it would be mostly like I'm an adult if I want to engage with technology or go to Vegas and put a hundred dollars on red or buy some mean coin um, that should be first and foremost my choice and if if I get hurt well so be it um, we don't right. outlaw cars either because people get killed in car accidents every day and so forth right anyway but so back to the actual topics um, of CBDCs, a lot of these um, papers will then reference stable coins. And I think we had a separate discussions about stable coins. And then there were now new hearings in, in Congress around the topic of stable coins. And yet again, this conflation of stable coin regulation. While that hearing was overall somewhat nuanced and had some representatives of kind of our industry, if you will, um, for the most part, they kind of yet again skipped over that particular aspect, not pointing out that regulatory agencies don't get to regulate technologies. Brian touched a little bit on that, but he should really have pushed back hard on that. And you always want to rephrase it as in, okay, do, do you really want to regulate the behavior of citizens to the extent that they cannot participate in new technologies and make up their own mind whether or not that is useful, right? So the difference obviously is between government issued fiat currencies, there is some mandates behind them, as in um, you have to accept this in the context of legal tender for or the repayment of debts and you have to pay taxes and government fines and fees into that. And as a side note, they are always, I, I like to inject that, uh, there's this whole confusion out there, even amongst bankers. They think that in the context of private commerce, you are limited to uh, government issued fiat currencies by legal tender laws. That's just wrong. That's just simply wrong. If you and I decide that within our context, Pokemons are money, then Pokemons are money. Money right. and foremost in um, a free society and overall around the world is an agreement. It's, a, it's actually a multi-tiered agreement. First, you agree on the language of value. So we might default to the language of value as US dollar. But then secondarily, we agree on the medium of exchange, right? So then I decide, okay, I want to give you cash. And you say, well, I don't want cash. I want I want a check. I want a wire transfer. I want whatever. Right? Right. So the, and usually we'll, uh, now the majority will default to bytes. But then again, bytes um, is the same medium of exchange that Bitcoin uses. It's the same medium of exchange that Ethereum uses. So every time that people say nonsense, like um, the unit of account for, for Bitcoin is Bitcoin, as in the lowercase b Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is the mining reward, right? So there is no minting function on, on Bitcoin. And if you look at your wallet, you can readily see what your unit of account is. I, I assume that if you look at one of your wallets on your phones, you probably see the, the value of your Bitcoin holdings in US dollar. But um, the larger point there though is, so this, this mechanism of moving bytes, that's the difference here. So that's why when people talk like, uh, I, I really respect Christopher, Christopher Giancarlo. He just published this book, um, Crypto Dad. And unfortunately, there's major mistakes in there that he shouldn't propagate. And that, that really, he should either change his title or he should change his contact, uh, content because he makes the major, major mistake of conflating DLTs and blockchains. And that's really unfortunate because he is one of the proponents of a digital dollar. So back... To, uh, to the digital dollar, obviously, and he makes that case too. He just doesn't make it quite correctly. Um, the, the dollar is largely digital. Most dollar movements are in, in byte forms and most movements of physical dollars actually happen outside of the United States. But uh, the, the difference is very simple. One um, entries are dollars in databases, and these databases are usually maintained by financial service providers who got the license to do so. And a digital bearer instrument like a Bitcoin is not tethered to a database, is not subsequent to a third party with um, a banking license or other financial services license, but I can move the bytes to you and I want to move a value of 
ten dollars to you i can do that and um, use the bitcoin lightning network or something else and move the same type of value but without ever touching a database so that's that's really the main difference it's bytes that are controlled by databases and by extension those who maintain the databases and bytes that are maintained by a universal computer that everybody has free access to and that I can engage with at will and that are sometimes censorship resistant. Unfortunately, that's no longer true for most of Bitcoin. It's no longer true for most of the quote unquote public blockchains due to the fact that the mining rewards are being stored at custodial exchanges and then attach PII to that. But Anyway, I'm gonna stop here. I tend to, as you know, keep going on forever and ever. But I don't want to <laughs> not at all. No, it's it's intriguing. Like I've I've always enjoyed uh, conversations with you because your um, your eloquence is is <laughs> unmatched by a lot of the guests we have on here. It's it's really fun well, just to listen to you, man. To well, be honest. I well, so for the past three years, I've tried to make this more concise. That's why. So we'll be publishing this book sometime later this year called Screening Money. But okay. it's literally something I've been working on for over three years. And I'm, I'm not alone uh, nice. working on that. I'm just basically channeling it. Yeah, well, keep keep us posted on that. I'd, I'd love to take a read as soon as it's ready. Um, so you, you touched on a few things um, right. that that I find interesting. One of which is the uh, non-pedantic difference between regulating um, currencies and, and the self-regulation that they already exist within, right? The, the code-based regulation. Just this morning, today's January 11th, I'm not sure right. exactly when this will air, Jerome Powell testified in yeah. front of Congress, right? And he- I, I was... had to turn that off. I was watching it at the gym. <laughs> I had to turn it off. It is, at, what, a... at what point? Oh, it's appalling. It's just like self-congratulatory and like, yeah. it's it's always when when he talks and that goes back all the way to Greenspan, it's like the, the child that throws a pebble into um, a lake and then he's very surprised where the ripples are coming from. It's like, right. I wonder what these ripples are. <laughs> yeah. so, How could this happen? Yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> because I mean, it's it's simply government interventionism with the public markets, right? So, and right. Uh, you, there's really no other way of saying this. Uh, he is lying, right? He is just yeah. straight up lying with, with the things he said. So that I could not listen to that anymore. And the self congratulate tone there is appalling because, um, I mean, to most people, I think that with any economic sense, it's, it's rather obvious that if you increase the money supply by 20, 30% in a matter of 18 months, that this will hurt the people most who live in a cash-based society, right? So right. who don't have assets, who have been sort of tricked to keep their money in quote unquote savings accounts and money market accounts, certificate of deposits, that pay less than 2% interest. And now you're inflating that away. So it hurts the people that can least afford it. And that that's appalling. I think he must, anybody in, in the position of power that has influence on, on these aspects simply must acknowledge that fact. It's intellectual dishonest, it's despicable. It's obvious that these externalities are happening and it's, it's happening to the people who can absolutely least afford it. And that's right. what's really, it's really, really disturbing about that. Right? And you probably saw that, but the Federal Reserve simply stopped tracking M1. Yeah. yeah they, just, so they first inflated it, if you see the graph, and then it's like, well, now we stopped tracking. It's like, yeah, it's, it, looks uh, like, it looks like a pump and dump. <laughs> yeah, a, exactly. Meme so, it's, uh, it's insane. Uh, th that's the other part to that. It's like so. Uh, so people um, like this this congressman from from California, Sherman, right? He he jumps on like quote unquote crypto scams and and whatnot when he is part of the system that commits the largest scam in history. <laughs> right? It's like that's like a, that meets all the definitions of a Ponzi scheme. 
like, the irony is, is hilarious <laughs> in this, this it, case it's absurd but again it's like for me this is is not a political issue i'm a technology investor for me it's simply the equivalent of we invented voice of ip and you and i can can talk for free That's right and we invented the same technology for the movement of value but for whatever reason we force citizens around the world to use the legacy technology right. rather than just stopping that nonsense so the last year um the payments industry was somewhere around i want to say 2.4 trillion 2.4 trillion to move bytes that's absurd exactly that's exactly what it is it's like and that's simply from a technology perspective right so it's, it's like the equivalent of forcing you to put a stamp on an email every time you send an email like, <laughs> right. why would you do that it's like that that is a problem that's entirely solved right so payments quote unquote is solved right? from a technical perspective there's many open source solutions you can readily apply to your fiat currency and but there's obviously externalities that come with that so you want to talk about the the, the three most um yeah obvious ones absolutely and uh and, and you mentioned one already which is obviously the loss of purchasing power um yeah and so that's... most people go there first and that's actually a secondary problem not a secondary problem so much as um a problem that is less important than the primary problem what do you think is a prime oh, well you read the article i guess well yeah, i'm kind of cheating here but obviously and, and right. you did touch on it briefly is is the surveillance right yeah and so there it's important so we'll always take a global perspective we, we invest in global disruptive technology we invest in network technology and they're specifically in disruptive finance and web three primitives and so um, within our expertise, we have been approached by some non-government organizations um, for our expertise because uh, there's one group, and I don't specify it too much so that there's no like potential light sh sh shown on, onto that that's undue at this point in time, but there is an organization where we support them um, with our expertise in terms of how they uh, consult their constituents and their constituents is comprised of people that live under authoritarian regimes mm. and so what they do is they help those dissidents that are being persecuted by their own government by transferring value and transferring information to them but since most of network technology as it's currently designed uh, serves one or more corporation at that point in time it's fairly easy to then pressure these corporations and handing over any kind of digital surveillance information to the government directly and oftentimes you will actually find that the nsa has servers directly in uh, the isps and in the facilities of cell phone carriers there's a lot of detailed reports from not conspiracy sites but very credible <laughs> public uh, organizations out there about that right um, and maybe shout out to to another podcast that i really in, enjoyed that i fell down the rabbit hole um it, it's called the the dark diaries so anybody who's specifically interested in, in cyber security will thoroughly enjoy that particular podcast i i got so addicted that i listened to all of his episodes in like two weeks and there's more than <laughs> but the, so but going back to the financial surveillance aspect and all work in that space so they reached out to us and said hey uh, we noticed that you um, are investing in these disruptive finance solutions and Web3 parameters. Would you mind looking over the recommendation papers that we're sending out to our constituents because we're spelling out how they should be using technology and what technologies to avoid as to not become victims of government surveillance? Because in our case, the surveillance might end up in some commercial activity where we're being profiled to buy something that we otherwise wouldn't buy or worst case getting social engineered into not vote as in the Cambridge Analytica example but in the case of those dissidents they are being profiled in order to be disappeared or worse 
And right. so that in a way has become our new threshold for technology as in can a dissident that's being persecuted by his or her own government with all the power of that government safely use that technology and if, if not not only shouldn't this individual use it but no one should be using it at the right. end of the day and so that's why it's important to understand that wh wherever you build these surveillance technology into your currency into your digital value exchange systems you are actively harming you're actively endangering people around the world right? because currencies are obviously in digital form not limited to any particular borders and that's really what worries me about the chinese efforts because it seems pretty clear that there's an agenda they are specifically uh, in the context of this belt and road initiative specifically in the context of of africa and just having this particular technology is just delivering a lot of potential for harm. And right. I'm, I'm putting this very mildly, right? Because it's not necessarily obviously, and that's always like the default position of people like Brett Sherman, that criminals can be using it, which it's a terrible idea for a criminal to use any type of blockchain-based solution and create an immutable record that's gonna be on there forever. Um, <laughs> right really dumb and it's actually very very hard still to this day to create any kind of transactions that ultimately cannot be surveilled at all it's really really difficult ultimately i think we we will solve that and have to solve that but yet again this is this is not to facilitate any kind of nefarious activity because uh, the default activity that you are doing with your bank account and your digital financial options is obviously not nefarious and and you represent the vast majority of people and so do i right so the vast majority of people just wants to buy their groceries and pay for their car and and not um live under the fear that at any given point in time your financial service provider or the government can decide that a we just want to create more of those digits so the hundred dollars that bought you the groceries for the week all of a sudden don't do this anymore and or they disagree with what you are doing entirely and just cut you cut you off entirely and that's made much easier if you have a cbdc and any of um, the claims in all of those papers um, that you read about, like pr protection of privacy, are usually followed up. But we also need to still like be able to do anti-money laundering errors, right? right? And always um, comes back to that. Yeah, and so that that's always like, but right, and there there's ample data available that the the current anti-money laundering mechanisms a hardly do anything i forgot what the number was it was sub one percent of right. uh, actual criminal activity that's being detected using those measures but then also it adds a tremendous amount of cost to every transaction right so there's right. every bank has a department now every little startup that wants to get in that space has a compliance officer and is paying an outside provider for KYC verification. And in some cases, that simply makes it makes the entire application not feasible. Right? So right. if you're if your onboarding cost for a new user is already a dollar fifty, regardless if he's ever going to do a transaction and your general conversion rate of a registered user might be something like 10%, all of a sudden. Uh, your user acquisition costs skyrocketed. And if you're specifically trying to facilitate financial services in countries where there are no banks right now, you're doubly penalized because those people have no means. For, for them, um, they just want to transfer 10 bucks. And uh, if they transfer 120 bucks in, in all of their life cycle, you're never able to um, return user acquisition cost. Anyway, so we went down yet another rabbit hole. Uh, always, always stop me there. But these are all kind of externalities that are attached to um, the financial sur uh, surveillance mechanism of the legacy financial systems that um, it seems to me pretty obvious 
the people that are issuing these papers want to hold on to in some shape or form or even in a way uh, make worse. And so one of the volunteer positions I also took on, I think since we spoke last, so now the co-chair of the banking and finance at the Decentralized Identity Foundation and there, most of my efforts is directed towards solving the what I consider the problem that is KYC. Because from where I'm sitting, the, the current implementation of what people call a know your customer. By the way, even uh, this term within the regulation itself is in quote airport, it's in quotations itself. So the, it, it's not about knowing your customer, right? So the, the obligation for the financial service provider is to mitigate and hopefully prevent money laundering. So, and for that, you don't actually have to obviously know your customer. There, there's actually some, a lot of nuance that people never talk about. But the larger point there though is um, the, these regulations in as they address two different things. A, they address the legacy service providers and then B, they address the legacy technology that these legacy service provider deploying. So more specifically, your account is a database, right? So it's a database solution, it's a ledger that's being maintained by this third party. And because it's maintained by a third party who gets to have custody, not only over your funds, but on your PII, there's kind of the stiff regulations attached to that because there's inherent um, hazard attached to that, a moral hazard uh, that we call the principal agent problem, as in it's your money, but I have it and I have control <laughs> over it. And so that's why we rightfully apply these constraints to them where they have reporting requirements, they have to reconcile with uh, the general ledger of the central bank system. But as an externality, you will have to eat up all the fees, right? That, that these things occur. So a larger point that being though, in the context of this KYC, so they start out at the moment you create your account, which that's already questionable. So A, um, there, there are some nuances to that that are somewhat bizarre. Uh, for example, when this surveillance act um, was passed. The marketing term is Patriot Act, which by the way, that's not the name of the act at all. That's <laughs> just the marketing label um, for propaganda purposes. But so when it was passed, there was this requirement uh, that you have to have a unique identifier um, attached to that account. And so what the bank decided to do in the United States context is to just default this to the social security number. Well, so there's a mandate that's directed towards these financial service providers that they have to ask for this number. So A, there's actually no requirement for you to have a social security number right? as, as a starting point. You don't have to have one. So, but um, in, there is actually a difference in, in the way that people at the bank, for example, could ask you that and actually commit a crime themselves because there is a, um, a criminal act called under the color of law. If I pretend to uh, represent the law and maybe I'll dress up as a police officer and tell you, you cannot enter the speech, right? So that's a crime. So you're pretending that you're representing the law. And what happens on a probably daily basis is that some person will enter a bank and uh, some bank teller in response to that person wanting to open a bank account will respond, well, um, by law, you have to provide me with your social security number. Right. That, that, that is a crime. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crime and the color of law. Every time a bank teller tells you that because there's no obligation on your part to give him that mom number and actually there's no obligation for you to actually even have that number to begin with. That's crazy. But factually, you can't open a bank account without it. Um, but right. so th this is just like a, an, an anecdotal side note, but so you already have to divulge all this personal identifiable data just to open an account. Obviously opening an account doesn't do anything and, and uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't enable you to money launder in that particular moment, but still you have to provide this at this particular point in time and then if you probably look at your last 1,000 transactions that you did with your demand deposit account, which um, 
people usually call their checking account. You'll probably notice you, that you could have done every single transaction in cash as well. It was just more convenient for you to draw from your checking account using a debit card or right. using an app on your phone or something else. But in every single instant, um, your PII and more was shared with four to five entities in the process. So point here being is, if, when, where we develop the technologies that are more nuanced, and I would argue they exist right now, at that particular point in time, if I implement them at the financial service provider level, then I can attach PII only if there's a legal requirement, and usually that legal requirement would be a court order, because um, in the United States, at least under constitutional law, you are protected from illegal search and seizure. So no one can just come up and say, well, give me your credentials. So <laughs> I want to make a copy of that because I feel like it or because you bought, you bought a banana at a banana stand, right? So that's, that's not a legal requirement. So a larger point there being though is to think about that. Once I provide you with the technology that enables law enforcement to inject that requirement only if there's a court order, well, then the wholesale surveillance approach should actually be unlawful, should be unconstitutional. And in my right. mind, oh, yes, right now, that's an unconstitutional thing to do. But then, so that is like a legal argument and as far as I'm concerned, an ethical argument as well. But then there's also a number of commercial arguments. So A, as we already pointed out, it's super costly to do that, to do right. this whole approach, but then there's an externality of sharing this data. And so I'll, I'll give a separate talk about the whole topic of cybersecurity, but um, to simplify this massively, it's impossible to protect, protect database solutions. Database solutions are the main culprit of data breaches. It should be kind of self-explaining, but um, point here being those, so now your data for every financial transactions is duplicated across four or five different databases. And all of these databases are accessible by database administrators, by customer service people, and by people who otherwise gain access to that. So this otherwise gaining access to that could be by something cumbersome, like actually hacking into the digital infrastructure in some shape or form, but the, the more common uh, hacking attacks are really social engineering. I, right. I somehow um, coerce you or trick you into giving me access to certain data that I otherwise would, shouldn't have um, access to. And you want to take a guess what the damages from the leader categories to the global economy were last year? Got to be tens of billions, right? <laughs> Think bigger. Trillions? Think yes. Oh, my goodness. The damages of um, just these, just, and that's just the reported cyber crimes, by the way. Right. Exceeded $6 trillion. <laughs> oh that's multiple times the market cap of all cryptocurrencies combined. Right. In so loss. In, in loss, this is just losses. This is not even, that's not accounting for the, the attempts of loss prevention. This is just <laughs> the, the reported losses, which by the way, this is larger than the GDP of Germany. It's larger than the GDP of Japan. Actually, there's only um, two countries that have a gross domestic product, which is greater than this particular damage to the economy, which is the United States and China. And so uh, interesting enough, um, that doesn't really come up in, in the context of discussions uh, around cybercrime. Well, there is an obvious solution, a very obvious solution, but it's, Feel free to you, <laughs> yeah, it's cryptographic primitives under owner control, right? And right. they are readily available. They are readily available right now. And so to simplify this and a creator, as you know, I'm not a big fan of metaphors, generally speaking, because there are so many unfortunate ones specifically in our space that distract from what's really going on. But 
uh, the, the metaphor that I like people to embrace is that in the physical world, banking services entail a service such as a safety deposit box. And a safety deposit box is, is useful. I think most people should have one and keep like their passport and, and other things in there in, in case of emergency and their house burns down or something to that extent. So most people, generally speaking, should have a safety deposit box. But the way that these things work in, in meat spaces, when you go to a bank, uh, the bank teller goes into that vault with you and unlocks the box with the general key, then he, she leaves the room. You use your key to unlock the box and you put something in, you take something out, you lock the box and the financial service providers and employees returning to the vault and is now locking the box. At no point in time uh, did he or she have access to the items that were in the box and didn't even know what's in there, shouldn't know and cannot know by law unless mm -hmm. there's a court order. So point of this particular exercise and metaphor is that is how it should work in digital space. So you're talking right about now, some sort of like a hybrid custody almost. I mean, yeah, and this is just a multi-sig, right? right? So if, if I want the value um, that I hold in digital form and the digital form could be dollars, the digital form could be yen, the digital form could be Bitcoin, if I want a, a custodian for that, well, then the custodian should not be able to actually take ownership of right. um, these items. He ju should just serve these particular security functions. And th there's another uh, troubling, in my mind, point to that because a digital money actually never exists in deposit form. So what I mean by that is, so people go to the bank and they think they're depositing money. Mm -hmm. From a legal perspective, that's incorrect. So if you give a bank money, what you're doing is if you're depositing it in your quote unquote checking account, you're extending an interest free loan to the bank. Digital money always exists in a state of lending. The difference is that you don't get to have the yield of the money that's in your <laughs> checking account. And obviously they, they multiply it by the somewhat misguided term of fractional reserve lending. But um, Actually, the, the reserve requirements since March of uh, last year have been zero regardless. Yes. But, but even before that, it was kind of a misnomer to call these things fractional reserve. So they were just safety requirements that most things were exempt from because they were collateralized. Right. But again, that's a it's yet another rabbit hole, but it's a really bothersome one in my mind because Essentially, it's a lie, right? So you're lying to people and saying that they are deposits. They are not. They are not deposits. Digital money is always in the state of lending, of course. And so, but but then the obvious next step is well, if digital money is always in the state of lending, well, then I want to be the one making yield from that. And since um, the the person that I'm sending the money to probably also wants to make, make yield for that, then what we currently call M1, at least the digital part of M1, so let's call it the, the payment currency, the payment function, um, doesn't really have to exist at all from a technical perspective, right? So you, you do an atomic swap, you do, you're moving digital value from one state to another, so from, from my wallet to your wallet, and it earns a yield maybe on Terra of 19% APY for me and uh, moves into whatever you decide is a, is a good um, allocation of capital and earn, it's earning yield for you. So there's, there's really no technical reason where at any given point in time, you need a custodian that takes ownership of that and then gets to inject a, their, their own rules on top of that and the rules of the local jurisdiction and then also gets to on the yield of that. So anyway, so right. well, I think I think there's an argument there, right? Because <clears throat> there is there are people out there who are not comfortable doing like me and you, of course, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with most DeFi and Web3 technologies. I don't mind jumping into even the more ridiculous yield farms and things like that. Right. And of course, you, you stabilize and and do things like anchor, like you mentioned. But what about and this goes back to your multi sig question or argument. What about those people that are not familiar or not comfortable with it yet? Are they excluded from this or do we find a way where the security protocols can be implemented without these selective incentives from 
the intermediaries being a being a problem do you think that's even possible uh, i mean as a starting point i think it's always important to point out the the majority of the world is either unbanked or underbanked right and so there's also like uh, again the, these somewhat dishonest um argumentation for cbdc's that somehow the implementation of central bank digital currencies will bank these currently unbanked but if you actually look at the data and and maybe even talk to those people you'll realize they're unbanked for reasons that have nothing to do with the failure of the central bank developing a central bank digital currencies they're unbanked a because they don't have government issued credentials and there's no indication that central bank digital currencies will be able to be accessed without government issued credentials of some form or shape or form and then be the the other cohort and there's obviously overlap simply doesn't trust the banking system and or the government or a combination of the two and most of the time obviously they're deeply ingrained because throughout their lifetime they have seen that either themselves or their parents have lost the entirety of their savings because of hyperinflation government confiscation or a multitude of other nefarious activities that were perpetrated by authoritarian governments and that's the majority of the world so we're not talking about the minority we're talking of most people um, that are alive on the planet today so they they wouldn't benefit from the implementation at all they wouldn't they probably wouldn't trust it maybe i'm wrong so, about that but uh, like based on the no, conversations that we're having that <laughs> seems unlikely. no i agree 100 percent. so do those people move to you know, obviously the, the unfederated digital currencies and at what point do they feel secure enough in, you know, going beyond just purchasing Bitcoin and holding it and moving into yield bearing assets? Um, you know, that, that adoption cycle seems like it would be long, no? Yeah. And they are so, again, to, uh, I always like to bring it on a higher level. So we, we have, as you know, if you go on CoinMarketCap or some place right now, some 10,000 or whatever it is right now. <laughs> and, and counting. <laughs> coins and, and tokens. And I mean, in principle, every single one of those is, is just a standardized smart contract. It's just bytes. And in principle, can bytes can move in principle at the speed of light. But the larger point there, though, being is there's an unfortunate amount of attention being given to these kind of standardized smart contracts because you can actually interact with them unless you have the right client software right so you right. need to let's let's call it a wallet uh you need to install a wallet either on your desktop and or on your phone and um, as you know there's also just simply web-based wallets like Moo and whatnot that, that you can can use to access those but a is obviously they're very cumbersome still to this particular um, point, but the larger point here being is ultimately um, all the solutions are to be had in that client software. Mm -hmm. Just like people don't really care uh, what what is the voice of IP protocol or if they're using it, they, they care if you can hear my voice when I talk into this microphone at the other end. And if that works just fine, then if you're telling me, well, you're using the standard initialization protocol invented by so and so, then people tend to really not care about that part. Yeah, right? So it's, it's a few true. geeks around the world that like to talk about these protocols. And there's another story about blockchain not being protocols, but uh, but the larger point there is, um, to, to me, all these discussions around new units of accounts is very much the same discussion uh, that people are having about having new colors for bytes. It's the same thing that the general user doesn't care right so what you're caring about is two things you want to a understand the value that you're moving so you want to see the value in the language of value that you have been indoctrinated in which is typically your government issued fiat currency if you grew up in the united states then your language of value is the us dollar and so right. that's why you see it as dollars. so as long as my quote unquote wallet shows me the value in dollars, then I'm, I'm happy because I understand that $10 buys me whatever bread or whatever groceries I 
I wanted to buy or whoever I want to send ten dollars to around the world. Whereas if I first have to explain to you that your banana cost you uh, about fifteen satoshis, then first <laughs> you have to explain to mom that a satoshi is a real thing and it does real stuff. So your mom probably doesn't care about it. But the, the larger point there being is that there's no reason to invent new units of accounts because. Um, the, the one thing that network technology and the internet being kind of the largest example of network technologies is outside of the US dollar, by the way, in printed form. It's the, the US dollar in printed form is the largest network technology, actually. But <laughs> outside of that, so the internet, uh, so the, the value of the network technology is, is your ability to engage with that and then facilitate real world economic activity while not forcing you to to learn a new language right so and at that point in time and that's the the overriding point to understand here is so the killer app is the first dab that will simply obfuscate whatever um color of bytes you're using and your color of bytes might be denominated in satoshi under the hood or they might be denominated in, in ether under the hood or some some other unit, but it really doesn't matter if and when uh, these bytes move at the speed of light and just show up in your mom's wallet in the unit of account that she is used to because she probably doesn't want to do that translation. So I don't expect like quote unquote cryptocurrency adoption, right? Well, we talked about that before. I still get emails about cryptocurrency adoption, blockchain adoption. E, it's it's a vacuous statement because you always have to explain, okay, adoption by who, for what, and why. And unless you're telling me that, you're not actually saying anything. <laughs> right? uh, but then also even there to expect that people in, in droves will uh, adapt to a new language of value uh that seems to be as likely as the world learning esperanto at this point in time i think at its height this artificial language was spoken by 150,000 people around the world and uh, i learned latin in, in school as a requirement for law school yeah and I, I, as you can imagine i rarely get the chance to speak it and i don't take many vacations at the vatican <laughs> uh, so for all intents and purposes, was kind of a wasted effort to teach that to me. Other than that, it was a requirement for law school. But larger point there being is, so people that still insist of that Bitcoin is is a unit of account, they they just don't understand that um, the the functions and the use cases of what we call currency and, and currency being money systems have separated a very long time ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So default medium of exchange is just bytes. And so the unit of account is really simply a user interface function. You just right. set it to what you want. Just if you download a new app and one of the first questions might be, okay, well, what's your primary language? And you, know, you choose naturally choose English. You don't think about it. And then what if the next question though is then how do you want to see your value and you get a list of 10,000 options? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would assume that it'd be more useful for most applications that expect kind of mass adoption to just default to the language of value that the user is used to. Right. And so that's, that's the important function that people still kind of keep ignoring the, the function of, of currency is simply that of language of value. So then its primary use cases in um, the fiat-based systems is that of lending, and the secondary use case is that of spending. So then what you wanna figure out then is within those use cases, how do you mitigate against the legacy externalities of legacy technologies, which fiat currency in that uh, regards for me as just a legacy technology, right? As a technologist, I look at this not as a fiscal tool, not as a policy instrument. I just look at this, okay, what is the efficient technology that we should be using? Right? It's, it's no difference than we had rotary phones. We don't today force people to keep quarters and use rotary phones because we have phones that in the back end all use 
the same protocol that's super efficient and makes our communication really, really cheap to the extent where it makes no sense to meter it. You just pay one flat fee and you get all the minutes across the entire planet for 60, 70 bucks and you can talk unlimited. Well, moving value is exactly the same thing. And I would argue it's actually probably from a technology perspective, much cheaper, right? And so right. that is my real rub. It's like all of these papers basically pretend we didn't invent digital variants to mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, your, your solution is right there. You can just adopt it, right? You just have to commit right. to it or, or you're committing to keep your people uh, disengaged from that kind of in the same vein that countries still today and for a long time have been outlawing certain technologies. Um, voice of IP was illegal, quote unquote. Again, let's, that's, that's really the conflation again of technology and people behavior, but Nachiko declared that voice of IP is illegal. Translation, you, my citizens, my subjects are not allowed to use that technology because I want you to use the state owned uh, telecommunication companies and pay us for the privilege by the minute. And so they enforced that rules as much as they as they could, because most people, obviously, if if you don't have the means um, to pay the state-owned uh, telecommunication agency to call your loved ones overseas, then the choice of downloading Skype and or installing a VPN uh, is a pretty easy one. Right. right people will just do it. So adoption is is never a matter of time. Adoption is always a measure of incentive. And the, the incentive is usually some form of pain. Right? So that's why in the United States, obviously, not obviously, but most people don't have a great incentive to adopt any type of cryptocurrencies for, for payment functions. Right. There's no need, right? So we are not a good example for that. But yeah, to, to bring this all the way by up to the, to the main problem, the main problem of legacy financial systems is the surveillance that it affords to government, government agencies, and they are specifically the ones that are hostile towards their own um, constituents and persecute their own constituents, and often in cases where they simply have a different opinion than <laughs> what is prescribed by the government. And then the second one is, is the obvious one that everybody can readily agree with that there will never be less government issued fiat currencies. There will always be more government issued fiat currencies. And uh, there we can go down the, the inflation rabbit hole again. I think we did that before. Um, so inflation is the creation of money for non-productive activities. Okay? Right. And, and then inflation is always individual. Like if, if I own assets, if I own a lot of real estate and I don't keep cash in my bank account, I don't have any money market accounts and um, that's where my wealth is, then inflation is good for me. <laughs> right? So they, they make more money. Yeah, Please. people with the assets exactly. always win. Exactly. Please make more money. But um, since before this exorbitant quote unquote money printing um, directly by the Federal Reserve. The, the real inflation was was done and is, con is con continued now uh, by commercial banks through the creation of loans for assets that already exist, so mostly housing. And so that primarily inflates that particular asset class and then secondarily inflates overall money supply. And again, that's it's it's always put in these very non-nuanced terms, if inflation is X. Well, the average X probably for last year is probably 18%. That's right. the average in the United yeah, States. So hyperinflation, I think, is defined as 30% months over months. But <laughs> I, I, I would argue anything that is um, more than, than 10% year over year I would consider hyperinflation <laughs> if, <laughs> if there's no equivalent tool to that, as in, well, um, what you're inflating away should always be matched by the interest rate that you can get risk-free. 
that would be a fair system, right? Because then you could bridge that gap and then you wouldn't have a scenario where you tricked people into believing that saving fiat currencies is a good idea, which by the way, since we talked for the first time, the, the money in M2, so the, specifically the money sitting in money market accounts and certificate of deposits now exceeds the combined outstanding mortgage amounts. So trans, right. translation, um, if you would, would just bridge those two classes and took took the commercial bank out of the equation, A, both of these parties would be better off. So people that, that use uh, fiat, government issued fiat currencies as a savings technology, and, and you bridged it with those that owe money on their houses. So these could, on one hand, get lower interest, on the other hand, get higher interest if you just took out the bank, because the bank distorts the picture the bank gets to create new, new money, gets to create right. money for nothing. And so it's simply a market distortion function as far as I'm concerned, right? It's, it's messing with the actual market dynamics, just like the, the Federal Reserve System consistently messes with, with market dynamics and artificially keeps interest rates low. The other part, and then I'll stop ranting about the inflation part is because they kept the inflation um, very low, and Michael Saylor makes a, makes a point a lot. You should borrow as much as you can, obviously, because if you can borrow money for, in some cases, 0%, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, how much, how much money, how, how, yeah, exactly, how much money would you, would you borrow? Well, you will borrow as much as, as the much bank as possible. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because whatever you're, you're doing with it is, 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 is more interesting. And unfortunately, though, since um, since a lot of publicly traded companies have been making use of that and they didn't really uh, have productive outlets, what they did is they started competing with stock buyers. So they bought back their own stocks. And mm -hmm. so that has led to the group of large inflation in the stock markets that we're seeing as well. Yeah. Right? So now we have an in housing market that's that's inflated by I don't know twenty percent maybe thirty, yeah. And we have a stock market that's inflated by twenty to thirty percent, which is good for the the asset class that we represent because <laughs> well, we buy equity and private companies, and that's kind of the the only area that you can't really inflate or buy it. There's so much money that flew into uh, that. Um, is flowing into this asset class now that we, we see, see unfortunately a lot of spray and pray. Right. Um, yeah, a lot, it's, especially it's, with the yeah. inception of Web3, yeah. we're seeing a lot of spray yeah. and pray. So then what was my third point here? So Unbanked. Third, yeah. Yeah, and I guess we already talked about that, right? So most people that are unbanked, they are not unbanked because of the absence of CBDCs. Right. The introduction of CBDCs will not bank them. Right. So what is the what is the solution? What conclusion do you come to knowing these problems, knowing the answers? Clearly not the banks. Um, right. You know, obviating the banks seems to still be the primary uh, directive that we need to to aim toward. Um, yeah. but you're, you're not, you're also not asserting that stable coins are the answer, uh, at least not long-term. So what is the current conclusion? Of course, your yeah, thesis I mean, may change. Yeah. As you, you know, better than obviously most, uh, stable coins is a much more nuanced discussion than, and that was my pro the problem that I had with the recent hearings in Congress again, because they, they tried to or they did explain stable coins yet again as these are fiat packs that are fiat backed right which those are obviously not the interesting ones right so the interesting right. ones are the algorithmic stable coins and the ones Absolutely. that don't that don't have a private issuer behind them because obviously yes if, if there's a private issuer issuing money yes so that that you're back to square one right, that, that right. Is, you've just recreated an old system Exactly. It, it, it's uh, the exact same thing. It might be slightly better because uh, the funds actually have the chance in principle to settle in real time. Right. Um, they probably still legally won't. It's kind of the, 
it's it's the same thing with like these window dressing solutions like Zell. From your perspective right. and my perspective, if we're using Zell, it looks like these things settle instantly because it's being subtracted from my account and shows up in your account. But ju that's just a complex matter of agreements. It's it's not the technology that facilitates that, right? And, right. and so in, in that same way, if you're creating this, this pack, then uh, you're doing the exact same thing. So you're entering into that agreement saying, well, I agree to have the funds for that. So when these um, US, the USD PAGs move, um, we basically guarantee that these funds are actually there. And if they are ever not, then everybody loses. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, uh, honestly, that, that's probably, at least in my mind, it's still better. And it's better because, well, if, if that's an option, then every bank should do that and should do this right away because then people have choices, right? And so, and with, with choices comes competition, with competition comes improvement. And so that comes back to why do people apparently trust Tether despite the consistent rumors? Because, well, it works just fine. Um, I can watch the transactions on, um, on the custodial exchange, as you can see it, it settles instantly in this unit of account that I am familiar with. And within that unit of account, it keeps its pack, it's stable, but then also the entire market cap of Tether turns over in its entirety at least once a day. And then some days four or five times the entire market cap, which uh, that's what we call the velocity. And if you then compare that uh, for this particular use case to the US dollar, where the US dollar turns over uh, its entire market cap in the last number that was um, published was uh, 90 some days. It's probably much lower now. Wow. Because of the, the additional supply. There's so much out there, uh, yeah. But so, which means to simplify this drastically and being wrong essentially, but so within that particular use case, um, Tether is 90 times better. <laughs> so just for that particular <laughs> use case, right? to make that very simple. And then obviously you could implement this for, for different use cases as well. Again, if it comes down to, I only hold on to it for as long as it's taking for it to move and the moving is 10 minutes or, or sub seconds, then do I really care that Tether is packed to something? Uh, I don't really, because I'm just gonna use it to move funds from my wallet to wo your wallet and in my wallet, I do a swap to what I consider to be a store value, right? So, and uh, maybe right. I'll just move it right into BDC or something else. And, but as an externality, then I mitigated against all the debasement of the underlying pack. And that's readily available to every person right now that wants to do that. The, the problem is that it's just very cumbersome. And the other problem is that it, actually, if you want to leave the system, there's still a lot of friction attached to that because that is still limited to um, bank money, to digital bank money right now. Exactly. And, and that, that's, that's the question the, we always get, right? How do I, right. how do I get out of it? How do I get my groceries with it, et cetera? Yeah, and then ultimately, um, I mean, it, it's going to be squeezed from two ends, right? So ultimately, where the, the purchasing power is eroding that quickly, people will a, adopt a different unit of account and with that different unit of account, if it's not available in physical form, so if I can't import physical dollars, but I have an option to download the wallet and get the equivalent of a US dollar in that, then I don't really care if that's USDC, Tether or something else. What I care about is that I can go to my grocery store and send this to the, the person behind the cash register and I'll, I'll get the wear set I want and I get to live another day because my, my local currency is, is being inflated away to a degree that I basically am I'm, I'm unable to use it for commerce. I'm unable to, to live off that anymore. Right. And um, so I'm, I'm working on a, an article right now that explains how this technology 
is actually the most important invention for the number one goal that the United Nations put out in their uh, list of sustainable um, sustainability goals, which is the alleviation of poverty. Mm -hmm. And a, a very large portion of people living in poverty and are, are um, basically condemned to live in that state is simply they don't have access to financial systems. So, so there's nothing they, they can do. There's nothing they can say if they, they have to do waste time on, on nonsense, right? Similar, I liken it to, to the fact just like when when you provide water to a village, for example, which is a super important thing, and I really support the the organizations that are working on that particular problem because it's so tangible. But uh, you don't think about the fact that right now you you turn on the faucet and water comes out, right? Right. Uh, but a person in sub-Saharan Africa, there might be a family member that spends several hours a day just walking to the next water hole and just pumping water into a bucket and then carrying it back and that's how that person gets to spend many hours a day sometimes right, right? so it's yeah. these second order effects so then if you're living in a cash-based society there's um, all these second order effects and you've probably heard of those so when you have a relative in a um in a country that is less safe than ours, you, you might send money there and she is he or she is then forced to pick it up at the Western Union right. in person and uh, show whatever credentials and or the QR code that she received from the relative. Well, obviously, people that are interested in people that picked up money know that too. So oftentimes these are the most dangerous places to go to because criminals know that you're picking up your physical cash there so they're waiting around following you home and robbing you at that point in time so that's an externality of these people being forced to use legacy technology so that's in addition to the fact that they're being nickeled and dimed to sending um bites around right so even though um the whole remittance thing is almost the smallest problem that we're looking at. It's like $600 billion or something. So it's really the smallest problem. It's very fragmented, but it doesn't have to exist at all. Right? And right. it comes back to, we are really penalizing the people that can least afford the legacy technology and the, the entities that we artificially keep alive, these parasites that are in the middle that we're keeping alive. It's not you and me that, that are being penalized the most. Right? right. And so to me, that's very disturbing, super disturbing. And it's, it's very unfortunate that this is not a focal point of these, these discussions. I think every discussion um, in all of those CBDC design papers should start right there, should start, well, we want to live in a free, free democratic society which means a, by default, a financial transaction, um, which as far as I'm concerned is protected by free speech, is private, is um, censorship resistant. And then secondarily, there shouldn't be a feat attached to that because if you, the government takes the stance that, that you get to regulate and issue currencies, well then, then currencies are public good. Well, treat them like a public good. Treat right. them like you would treat water, electricity, make it accessible to everybody at the lowest cost. And at this point in time, the cost is really close to zero, right? As you and I know, as every technologist in our space knows. So it's yeah. intellectually dishonest to just sidestep that and pretend we didn't invent digital bearer instrument. It's and it has been bothering me to such an extent over the last couple of months that I'm just directly trying to speak to people who, who issue those and call them out. It's like, why are you doing this? So you're, you're on the wrong side of history. Why are you doing That's this? exactly the right. direction we need to be taking right now, right? And is, is actually addressing the, the regulators who, who have the power to, to make and change these laws and getting more allies on our side. So I, I respect that. Yeah, and instead we're talking about nonsense like regulating stable coins, 
Like, so. Yeah, right. You're, yeah. You're talking about things that don't matter, right? So you're, you're trying, A, from a technology perspective, you're trying to catch a beam of light. So, as I mentioned before, that this is plumbing, right? So, if and when and where it's, um, it is implemented correctly, there is no regulatory exposure, right? Skype didn't get any telecommunication license. So, the point there being as, just read the original white paper. This is about peer-to-peer -peer cash. So regulation addresses primarily the principal agent problem, the fact that you have a middleman, the fact that there's someone in the middle who can do something with funds that don't belong to them. But the, more, the almost more important part is they can do something with the data that they have on you. And that has right. way more nefarious and drastic effects on a much larger portion of the population. So the, the, the negative externalities outweigh any um, even imaginative uh, damages from anti-money laundering and so forth. That is just nonsense. Right? It is. And it's just the narrative that they've chosen to uh, purport, you know, and it's, uh, it's a fallacy, right? Yeah, totally. And so, but so the call to action to developers is really to to pay attention to that. And so, your technology should be implemented in a way that a dissident um, living under authoritarian regime can safely use that without yeah. having to jump through hoops. If you implement it in this particular way, your technology is viable, and your technology will be used for freedom purposes will be used to enable people that are excluded from the financial systems, not because they're nefarious actors, but they don't have a government issued credential or the or banks just decide that they are not worthy yeah. of being able to participate in that, right? Uh, th this is up to the technologists. That's my point, right? So yeah. that's a call to action. So I did stop, stop like talking to Congress and placating um, their false arguments, just call them out. It's like you're just lying. Yeah. A, fr Hello. frame it correctly, and then B, let's talk about the real problems. Let's talk about the real problems of legacy technology. Let's talk about what is the actual invention that Bitcoin introduced, and let's talk about how it can solve the most uh, uh, important problems right now and. The thing is, we are going the wrong direction right now. I'm super, super concerned about it. We're so. totally going the wrong direction. And the, the people that are being asked to speak up about that, they're being too timid yeah. to call that out. Because right? they have their own incentives to work yes. within the system that's built. Yes, but it's very short-sighted. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's super short-sighted, right? Because, um, again, it, the, the ultimate saying is always the same. You cannot uninvent technology. Right. So digital bearer instrument exists. We just need to put the focus on the right client technology and stop, talk, stop inventing new units of accounts and stop talking about things like DLTs, understand overall network topology, which is the much bigger topic. Um, so yeah, and the, the webinar that we're doing tomorrow, I'll, I'll talk about topology again, because that's still not understood. People still think that uh, blockchains are protocols and not protocols. People still think that DLTs are blockchains, which they are not. Right. And so I literally maintain a list of all of these entities and projects, and we will just actively invalidate them with new solution <laughs> just go after them and point out okay yeah you, you're doing the violations of the past you're violating the herd immunity of your chain if you're committing pii to immutable records which should be self-explaining but if i look around it doesn't seem to be yeah i see i see horrendous uh <laughs> security cyber security practices as well as ethical stuff all over the industry but um you know wise words an evocative call to action um, Christian, you know, I wish I had way more time to speak with you today, but I, I'm running out of time. Um, I really do appreciate you coming back on the, on the show. 
And um, there's always more to, to discuss with you. So I hope you'll come again soon uh, so we can talk yeah, more. I, I think, yeah, the other work we need to get out is on topology. But... Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to happy to make that the, the topic of the it, next it one. It sounds like a boring topic, but honestly, un unless you understand the evolving network topology, you are basically unable to develop a DAP, any decentralized application that will be viable within the context of the new to topology. That's that's an interesting assertion. G give me give me the the cursory overview of what. Yeah, what so so the, the metaphor I came up. Um, with for the time being until I refine it is if you look at current network topology, so the World Wide Web, if you want to call it that, sure. then uh, the, any a network endpoint uh, looks at you, the, the individual, exactly the same way that the endpoint would look at a weather station or any other IoT device. So it will observe your digital behavior. So we'll observe that data, we'll store the data, duplicate it, distribute it, and then refactor it. And that refactoring uh, we call profile, right? So we profile it. And then the next time you engage with a platform, Google, Facebook, they use that particular refactored data to profile you. And then uh, as an externality, you're basically a non-player character within the Google game. And so as soon as you uh, exert a new digital behavior, you put the letter E into Google, um, you get a suggestion, right? You can just try it out or give you a suggestion. Well, that suggestion is, is not based on your likes and preferences. The suggestion is based on profiling. The profiling is done on behalf of a for-profit entity and it's directed towards you as being now top of funnel and then moving you down that funnel to a particular outcome. Right, which is so usually purchasing pur something. <laughs> purchasing something or not doing something, uh, it, it, the platform doesn't care. So it will sell that real estate, that eyeball, uh, that attention to whoever bids the Absolutely. most. And right. maybe I bid the most because I want to indoctrinate you in my way of thinking. And my way of thinking is you shouldn't do vote for blue buckets, you should vote for red buckets or the other one. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. But the, the point there being though, is so, so the current network, in the current network topology, you're a non-player character. So you're kind of an Oracle function that it observes. So what do we need to do in order to fix that is to give you agency back. How do you get agency? Well, you get agency by controlling all these bytes that right now, uh, the platform that you are engaging with is controlling. So um, every brow uh, every uh, thing that we call a wallet right now is basically a browser, right? So you're browsing entries on, on a blockchain, you get to manipulate those entries to which you have the private keys for. Sure. But th think about that paradigm. So obviously the bytes don't care what, what they represent. So the bytes could represent your first name, they could represent a hundred Satoshis, they could represent a picture of your driver's license. But the point there is, so cryptographic primitives um, could be used then for you to exert complete control over all your digital dust at all times. And um, there's many, many laws that actually provide for that, but what we don't have is the technology to enforce that. Right. And the, I think what most people still haven't realized that we actually have all the power we just don't have the, uh, the technology to exert that power. And so the, the one simple example for that is, so in, in one case, Facebook, as you probably know, paid a $5 billion fine to the FTC for certain data violations. In another case, Facebook paid a $550 million fine to one state in the United States, I wanna say it was Illinois for the violation of their biometrics laws because um, Facebook uh, used that data to train the AI for facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So think about that. So if when we are I have the technology to assert property rights over all of my data, 
at that point in time, I, I can then also measure if and when and where it's being abused in a way that I didn't consent to, which is happening every single day of every, uh, every single second of every single day. Good. So once I reverse that paradigm and I, I stream access to my property, to my data, at that point in time, A, I can penalize the opposite, and then B, I'm no longer an oracle. Right. You're I'm a part no of the network. I'm no longer a clear character. I get to set the direction, and right. the direction could be, "Hey, I my browser notices you have all this data about me that I didn't consent to, and so my personal browser will issue just a command saying, okay, you got X, Y, Z many days, depending on what jurisdiction that is, to provide proof that you deleted that because I never consented to that. Yeah, and then." Yeah. And moving forward, I will stream access to the subset of data that I'm interested in sharing with that platform on a moment-to-moment -moment basis when that's useful to me. But otherwise, you don't get to retain a copy of that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's in my mind uh, my current stance. Uh, as, as I as you know about me, it's like for me everything is a thesis, right? So, uh, but at at the moment from a like hierarchical perspective, that's how I look at this. This is the new topology where I'm an agent again that has rights and the technology to assert those rights over all my digital dust, over all my agency. Facebook doesn't get to direct my eyeballs, not that I have used that in a very long time. <laughs> and um, Google doesn't get to decide what's the first suggestion is it's based on on my choices right 100 yeah. anything else to me um makes us slaves to that technology and i mean there's so much data now available with the whole facebook whistleblower uh, papers that we know about the externalities of doing it the other way around. Right. right. Anyway, so yeah, that, that's, but that's uh, obviously, uh, at least to me, it's obvious the more important topic. So then once you solve that part, solving value transfer is just a subset of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's, right. that's a fascinating, complete rabbit hole we can dive into for yes. sure. So, um, so that's yeah so that, that's why that's important to understand so that the one thing that that bitcoin solved is a subset of the byzantine's general problem so it's right. this and which is simply uh, a network compute problem it's just the fact that i i couldn't send you data before without proving to you that i don't have a copy of it what satoshi called the double spam problem so right. but so we need to just focus on that part everybody seemed to have jumped down the rabbit hole of oh we're, we're solving for peer-to-peer -peer cash and we need to have more and more currencies and and so forth that that is not understanding what this technology fundamentally delivers on and once you understand this and if you're moving a bytes that are denominated in bitcoin or us dollar or something else it, it's again it's, it's just a nuance that is not all that important from a technology perspective. The technology really doesn't care. Yeah, that's such a that's such a true statement, and I think we'll start to see that over time. Right, um, <laughs> these apps will become more standardized. You will be you will be sending and receiving whatever unit of account you prefer, uh, regardless yeah. of what's happening in the background. Yeah. So yeah, I call that least cost routing, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, right. whatever whatever is most beneficial and you just set your app to that it's like okay first i said it i wanted to see it in us dollars and um on the other end people will just tell me what do you want to see it's like what do you want to see and usually it will if you're in the same country it will the us dollar but how it gets there is is a decision of the client server technologies. It's it's right. not a decision you want to make on a <laughs> moment to moment <laughs> basis. It's like, oh, let me see. First, I'm gonna buy some ether, and then I'm gonna buy some dye, and then <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's friction not everyone wants, but some people will, and I think that's what makes the dynamic of crypto a little bit more interesting than something like uh, VoIP 
because there are incentives beyond just the use case of the technology. We have additional uh, opportunities underlying um, and underpinning really the, the whole functionality of these networks um, that we can actually participate in. I think that's interesting. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see how that evolves. Yes, but it keyed us to an entirely different problem. And whenever you conflate those, unfortunately, you don't solve any. So the typical example, obviously, is Ether, right? So Ether was a DDoS mechanism initially. Now, if you look at the website, all, all of a sudden it's quote unquote ultra sound money, which is all, it's obvious nonsense, right? It's, it's obvious nonsense because mm-hmm. um, you're actually not even saying it. Uh, as we discussed, money is in, money in my head is just my language of value in between two people as an agreement. So to say that something is ultrasound money is utterly meaningless. You need to talk about the use case. Is the use case spending? Is the use case lending? Is the use case store value? It's like, uh, okay. And then again, it, it's not about that standardized smart contract because the overriding um, technology here is your client server technology. So it's your, it's your wallet right. and what, what it does with it, right? And so, and the other part to that is if it's the quote unquote mining reward or otherwise an incentive mechanism on whatever public chain. So at that point in time, uh, as we have seen for years now, then it's subject to speculation. And so if it's subject to speculation, it basically defeats any other mechanism. Right. It can't really be used for spending if the potential for it to go up is high. It it can't be used for anything, right? Because, I mean, it's ultimately it's a unit of account. Well, if you first have to like translate your unit of account and measure anything, it's not a very useful you know, regardless <laughs> what you want to measure, right? Well, I think uh, that's why I think that's why things like Terra are interesting, at least yeah, to me, right. um, because you have this sort of balanced incentive system, and of course, there's a, a stable coin on the other end that is the unit of account, but you can speculate on Terra, and as the and you know how it works, and I'm not going to explain Terra to you, but I think yeah. that's interesting, and I think we'll see more of that stuff, right? Yeah, but the network effects um, you get from the application, that, that's the confusion. Yeah. Right, right, okay. Yeah, no, that's the a good point. Net, all network effects will, will come from the application level. It doesn't yeah. matter how great the compression is on, on your protocol, right? If there's, there's so much friction involved for whatever local person to, to use your application, still not going to happen, right? Exactly. You, you have, so you have to solve one particular use case, you have to solve it well, and you have to meet people where they are. You don't want to introduce a new language of value <laughs> to them. And that's your starting point. And then you just do that. And what, which I have this discussion pretty much on a daily basis where some engineer will say, well, and then you just do that and just do that. Well, um, you just lost 90% of people (laughs) because they won't just do that. We know that it's like, how many apps have you installed and then stumbled across that little bit of friction and you never finish registration, right? It's It's like each, each each friction point, I think loses like, 25 or 30 percent of people like each time they experience it you're losing another you know 20 30 percent of individuals that would have converted to your app yeah Um, you you really have to solve um a real hard problem for a user in order to jump to to a bunch of of those different friction points oh yeah exactly it has to be well worth the investment of time in order for them to jump through those hoops you're right and it's true well, Christian, I'm, I'm going to be late for my next meeting if I, if I, don't, if I don't end this right now. But sure. um, as, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure, enthralling conversation, and I can't wait for the next one. Um, I know you have some stuff on the horizon. Is there anything you wanted to let the listeners and viewers in this case know about before we sign off? Um, yeah, I just published an article on uh, Forbes a few weeks ago at the middle of December on um, DeFi uh, actually being kind of the wrong term. DeFi is really the first fintech. 
Okay. If people want to read this and chime in on that, as you know, I only publish things for peer review. I, I don't need anybody to like it, but if anybody <laughs> thinks I'm wrong about that, that's what, what I'm interested in hearing. Absolutely. Well, we'll make sure to link to all of the, uh, the articles and books and things like that, that we discussed throughout the article in the show notes and the description of the video. Um, Christian Kamer, uh, absolutely always an enthralling conversation, uh, managing partner at Sussany Capital. Christian, uh, thanks again. And uh, viewers, you know where to find us online, dvproject.org. Check out the blog if you want to learn more about this episode. We'll see you guys next time. 